war were passing themselves off as men. So that in and of itself makes it hard to find the women among the men. And the only, the only way we can document these women is if they were discovered to be women while in the service, or if they spoke about their service after the war, and many of them didn't. So we don't know how many women fought. It was in the hundreds, possibly thousands, compared to the number of men who served, of course, the women are statistically insignificant, but considering the time in which they lived and the social backdrop, it's stunning that so many women made an independent decision to go off to war and that so many women went to so much trouble to serve their country. So the way they served their country as soldiers was the first thing they had to do was pass themselves off as a man. So cut the hair, get some men's clothes, bind their breasts, try to lower their voice. I'm not sure I would have would have passed as a man for very long, but but since Victorians were 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 very socially bound just by clothing that if it wore pants, it must be a male. And that's one of the things that really, really did help women. Army exams were perfunctory. Most soldiers didn't take their clothes off to get into the army. The doctors were just checking their teeth if they had reasonable eyesight. So most women breezed right in. The difficult part, of course, wasn't getting into the army. It was keeping up the fiction that they were men while also enduring all the horrors and hardships of being in the army. So I mentioned earlier that women, the vast majority of the women that we know about are women who were discovered while they were serving. And so they were found out in a number of ways. Um, the saddest is women who were not discovered to be women until they were dead on the battlefield. And, and oftentimes, even then they may not have been detected except the, the folks who had the horrible job of digging graves often rifled through the bodies for any valuables. Most commonly women soldiers were discovered to be women because they were wounded and they were wounded in places that necessitated the removal of, of uh, key items of clothing. Women were also discovered when they were forced into very close quarters like a POW camp. Some women were discovered to be women very, very quickly just because they weren't very good at pretending to be men. We have cases, we do have cases of women being found in the ranks within 30 days of enlisting. And I, I have a feeling I know what that was about. And then six, six women were not found out to be women until they had babies. Six. How they hid that, I don't know. It just it of of all the stories of women in in the ranks during the Civil War, that's the one that just it just wows me every time, every time. So the picture we're looking at, it hasn't been a hundred percent confirmed, but I believe this is a woman passing as a man. Unfortunately, we don't know who she is. This next picture is of Albert Cashier. And uh, Deanne, if I can interrupt really quick, I'm sorry. Uh, the yeah. pictures are still small. I'm still looking at the thumbnails. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, <laughs> let me try to make it bigger. Why won't it let me make it bigger? 
Maybe oh, just open okay. it to the viewer. Is that better? Uh, still not seeing it. How's that? Mm. Uh? Mm -mm. We still see the the just the uh, the file uh, window <gasps> open. Yeah, if you double click and, and open it, I think that'll do the do the trick. How's that? Uh, still not showing through. Okay, I'm sorry. On my screen, it's it says I'm screen sharing. Mm hmm. Okay, now it's gone, right? Can I try again? Correct. Yep. Now try again. Sorry for the interruption. I know that, but I know everybody's going to want to look really close at these images. You know. Okay. Can you see it now? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, Shit. we had we had one speaker with a, a grandfather clock going off in the background, uh, you know, quite often. So this is <laughs> this is there you go. Oh, perfect, 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 perfect. Thank you so much. Is that it? Okay, okay. Um, so. I'll start again. So this is a photo that a number of us really do believe is probably a woman in disguise, although we don't have any proof. And it's the shoulders seem a bit narrow, but it's mostly those hips is, is why those of us who research women soldiers got really excited about this photo. Now this is a photo, is, am I still doing okay with the photos? Yep, it's okay. great. Thank you. So this is Albert Cashier and a comrade in the 95th Illinois Infantry. So Albert is the one without a beard. And there are about three known photos of Albert, but this is my favorite because you get a sense of the camaraderie and the brothers in arms experience that that she had as a soldier. Another question that is often asked about women soldiers is why why did they do it? Why would women go to so much trouble and endure a danger that society did not expect them to endure. And there were, there were three reasons. The first obviously was patriotism. They believed in the cause of their country. The second was love. Quite a number of women who went to war, went to war with a loved one usually a husband, there's some fiancés, uh, a brother, at least two women went to war with their dads because they didn't want to be left home alone. And in a lot of ways, their motivations mirrored the motivations of men who enlisted. And once women were in the ranks, they were in the ranks and they endured the same hardships as the men around them. They faced the same dangers. And interestingly, what they did not face once they were in the army, when they were perceived as men, they did not face gender prejudices. They were viewed, they were judged on the same basis as the men they were with because people thought they were men. And they also were able to take on all the rights of citizenship that were denied to women in the mid 19th century. So women soldiers, we've documented them at battles from first Manassas to Appomattox. We have documented women soldiers at Shiloh, at the Seven Days, Antietam, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Bentonville. 
And in the Peninsula Campaign, the Red River Campaign, the Nashville, Atlanta, and Overland campaigns. We also have documented women as prisoners of war. And women soldiers were discovered at Johnson's Island, Rock Island, Point Lookout, Old Capitol, Belle Isle, Florence, and Andersonville. What I find interesting about women who were captured and imprisoned is the fact that they were women was almost a guaranteed get out of jail card. And many women did not play that card. They were soldiers, they were bound to their comrades and they rather than turn themselves in and try to escape the conditions, they, they toughed it out and typically were outed just because of the close confines of a POW camp. The picture you're looking at right now is Frances Hook. She was a prisoner of war. What we know of her story is she was from Chicago. She enlisted in the army with her brother she and her brother were orphaned and she did not want to be left alone. So she went to war with him. She was captured in December, 1863 near Florence, Alabama and sent to Atlanta as a prisoner of war. She tried to escape and was shot in the leg. And that led to the discovery that Frank Miller was a woman because she was a woman, she was part of a special prisoner exchange in February 1864. So she was initially treated at a Union hospital in Chattanooga. Then she was transferred to Nashville. And it was while she was in the hospital in Nashville that this photograph of her was taken. And when she sufficiently recovered her leg wound, she was dismissed the service and put on a train back to Chicago. This is Rosetta Wakeman. She was, uh, she's one of our more famous women soldiers. We know a lot about her. She was a farm girl from upstate New York. Her family was perennially in debt. And so when she was 17, she left the farm and got a job as a maid. And she needed to support herself. And she also wanted to send money back to her parents. And at some point she realized that if she was a man, she would make a lot more money. So prior to the war, she put on her brother's clothes, cut her hair, assumed the name of Lions Wakeman and got a job as a canal boatman in upstate New York. At the end of her first trip down the canal, uh, she and others encountered army recruiters and she enlisted on August 30th, 1862 in the 153rd New York Infantry. Uh, the first two years of her military service was in Washington, DC, mostly on guard and provost duty in the defenses of Washington. And then her unit was transferred to take part in the Red River Campaign in Louisiana. Sadly, like a lot of soldiers in that campaign, Lyons Wakeman died of chronic diarrhea in New Orleans on June 19th, 1864. And she was buried as Lyons Wakeman and she now rests in the Chalmette National Cemetery. A, a question I've always had is, is Lyons Wakeman was in the hospital with chronic diarrhea, which is debilitating. She was in the hospital for nearly a month, but nowhere in her, or shall I say, nowhere in Lyons Wakeman's military records does it indicate that anyone 
discovered that this soldier who was wasting away was a woman. It, it seems almost impossible to me that no one in the hospital learned this secret, but it, but if they did, it was not recorded. And again, she was buried under her assumed name. This is another photograph that probably everyone has seen. It's Frances Clayton. I call this her glamour shot because it's it. the photo was taken after she left the army. So she enlisted with her husband in a Missouri regiment and he was killed in front of her at the Battle of Stones River, at which point she went to her commanding officer, said, I'm a girl, and he said, go home, and she did. But after leaving the army, she decided to go on a speaking tour and talk about life in the army. And so this was one of the publicity photos that was taken for her for her, uh, for her speaking to her. This is another woman soldier. We don't know exactly who she is. The caption on the back of this photograph says Cora's sister. That's it. So this is Cora's sister and well, we don't know where Cora was from. I like to show the photo and I looked to see what women soldiers we have, uh, we've documented that have a connection to Michigan. So here we go. Mary Burns, enlisted in the 7th Michigan Cavalry and was dismissed after 10 days. So she wasn't very good at passing as a man. Annie Lillybridge and Marion Green both enlisted with their fiancés, Annie in the 21st Michigan Infantry and Green in the 1st Michigan Mechanics and Engineers. Ella Reno briefly served in the 8th Michigan Infantry and Lizzie Compton temporarily served in the 25th Michigan Infantry. Lizzie Compton was a serial re-enlister. Every time she was found out and kicked out of her regiment, she would just travel to a new place and enlist in a new regiment. And I think she holds the record at serving in seven different regiments. And, and it was while she was in the 25th Michigan that she got shot in the shoulder, which was another uh, time she was discovered. And I often wonder about someone like Lizzie, who was just so determined to stay in the army, to, to re-enlist seven times in different regiments. She was, she was determined. The most famous woman soldier from Michigan or with a Michigan connection, of course, is Sarah Emma Edmonds. Sarah Emma Edmonds, this is a post-war photograph of her. She is in the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, she also has the worst, she has the worst Wikipedia article I have ever read. I, I, one of these days I have to be a, learn how to edit on Wikipedia and completely rewrite it because it's terrible. Don't, don't go there. But here's Edmonds' story. Edmonds, Michigan's Edmonds, is perhaps the most well-documented woman soldier of the Civil War. And that's partly because she wrote her memoirs. So Sarah Emma Edmonds 
was born in New Brunswick, Canada. She was a farm girl. And as a teenager, she ran away from home. She had an overbearing father who was trying to marry her off to a much older man that she didn't want to marry. So she ran away from home and the way she did it was, again, she, she cut off her hair, she put on her brother's clothes because she didn't want her father to follow her and find her. And she made her way to Michigan. She was 17 years old and she's in Michigan. She, she's free of her father, but she also has to make a living in the world. And she assumed the name Franklin Thompson prior to the war, because much like Rosetta Wakeman, she understood that if the world perceived her as a man, she could make a better living for herself. She had much more opportunities and she got a job as a book salesman and was doing quite well for herself in her assumed life. And then the Civil War broke out and she enlisted in the 2nd Michigan Infantry on May 25th, 1861. And in her almost two full years of service, she was a regimental nurse. She was a regimental mail carrier. She served as orderly to General Poe during the Battle of Fredericksburg. And unfortunately, she also contracted malaria during the Peninsula Campaign. And malaria is one of those illnesses that keeps coming back around. One recovers and then can have relapses. And it's, it's malaria that ultimately drove her from the army. She, she was sick and there was at least one soldier in her regiment who knew that Franklin Thompson was a woman and kept, kept the secret. Another comrade who had helped nurse her through one of her malarial outbreaks, she wouldn't go to the hospital because she knew she'd be found out and she didn't, she didn't want to be discovered. And finally, rather than go to the hospital, she deserted on April 19th, 1863. From there, she made her way to Ohio and I believe she was in Kentucky when she deserted. She, she had friends in Ohio and she went to them and convalesced with her friends. And that is where she wrote her memoirs. Um, Nurse and Spy was her memoirs. And this is where some controversy about Edmonds comes into play. Her memoirs were highly fictionalized, if not fully fictionalized. She, she understood she had to write a rip roar and good tale to sell books. And, you know, in her book, she claims to be a spy. There's no real evidence for that in the military records of Franklin Thompson. Franklin Thompson was detached from his regiment as regimental mail carrier, but there's, there's no evidence for, for these, these very melodramatic spying escapades that, that she writes about in her book. But she does have a military service record. She, so she published her book. She married uh, Linus Seeley in 1867. They had three sons. And in the 1880s, she decided that she needed her soldier's pension because she never really recovered. The, the malaria haunted her, uh, attacked her for the rest of her life. And she wanted that disability pension, but she had two problems. The first problem is proving that Sarah Edmund Seeley 
it was the same person as Franklin Thompson. And second of all, deserters can't get pensions. So she went to a reunion of the second Michigan. Uh, her, her former brothers in arms recognized her. They were a bit taken aback. And knowing she would get nowhere with the pension bureau, she directly petitioned Congress to get a soldier's pension. And numerous men with whom she served supported that petition. They, they wrote affidavit or they, they signed affidavits, they sent letters of support and she did indeed get her, her soldier's pension. And she's one of the few women that we've been able to document as getting pensioned for their service. Part of that might be women's reluctance to come forward after the war and talk about their service. It might be because women's names change. And when we check indexes to pension files, we're not looking under the right names. That's, that's often a problem with researching women is, is the changing surnames. But Sarah Edmonds got her pension. Her pension file is now online. If you go to archives.gov, you can see a digitized version of her pension. She died September 5th, 1898 in LaPorte, Texas, where her family had moved. And she is buried in the GAR section of Washington Cemetery in Houston. And I'd be happy to answer any questions y'all have. That's outstanding. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, here we go. First question is from Christopher Hayden. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Go ahead, Chris. Where were some of the were any were some of the women soldiers who were discovered ever court-martialed or otherwise persecuted or no? I did not find any court martials of women. I did find one court martial where one of the charges was it was against an officer, and one of the charges was knowing he had a woman in the ranks. What, what typically happened, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the time, if a woman was discovered in the rank, she was just summarily sent home. That was the most common thing. It was, it was the most common reaction, but there were, there were cases where the officers who, who made the discovery or were informed were concerned that that the woman was there as a spy so some women were thrown in jail and accused of spying there were um that tended to be the result either they were sent home or they were thrown in jail and had to to plead their innocence and in some cases they were they were jailed for a long time and usually not brought to trial they were just uh there was a women's prison in massachusetts fitchburg where it was a state prison that the federal government used to send some of its women political prisoners and at least two women soldiers ended up in Fitchburg accused of being spies. Okay, thank you. All right, it looks like the next question we have is from uh, P. Frank. Right, go right ahead. Oh, hi, yeah, I'm Patricia Frank, hi. I had a question, um, do you ever, do you know whatever happened if Francis Hook's brother made it through the war and they were reunited? He died. Oh, okay. Thank you. He died. And, and that's the, the interesting thing about her story is 
he was her only, you know, he was her family. And when he died, she stayed in the army. <clears throat> and she stayed in the army because she said that the army had become her family. And, and so that's why she stayed. And she stayed till she was captured. We do know a fun thing about Frances Hook is, is, is she did marry and have children and in the war department files at the national archives there is a letter that her daughter wrote to the war department in 1909 asking for her mom's military service records which i think is the coolest thing thanks i agree all right the next question we have is from tony Tony, go ahead. Tony, it, uh, I think you're still muted. Uh, is Tony still there? Oh, yes. Um, in looking at uh, pictures, and I might be mistaken, but it seemed like most of the, uh, the women soldiers were with the, uh, with the North. Uh, did the South have as many women who uh, also pretended to be uh, males, male soldiers? Uh, of the research I did, there were women Confederates. I have never, I am unaware of any photographs for sure of, of women in the Confederate armies. None have come to light to my knowledge. The split from my research is 70-30, 70, 70 Union, 30 Confederate. And I, I think that's probably because, well, well, for one thing, the Union Army was bigger. And also the Union Army is better documented. A, a lot of Confederate records did not survive the war. And so, so yeah, I, I'm comfortable saying there were certainly more union. There may have been way more Confederate women than have been documented. Okay. Thank you. All right, Tony, thanks a lot for your question. Uh, Deanne, there's, uh, there's a question in the Q&A box. Uh, I believe uh, Anne asks, do you know of any female soldiers who received military honors? Um, military honors well the only official medal given during the civil war was the medal of honor and the only woman who's ever received that is dr walker i'm i'm not sure we had women who got promoted we we did find a woman lieutenant but i'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by honors you know, Anne, if you want to, uh, would you want to ask your uh, question? If you have a microphone, you're more than welcome to ask the Anne your question verbally, uh, if you can. Let's see. Okay. Oh, oh, she just said, uh, just said Mike isn't working. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> I, I think we've all been there before uh, a time or two. <laughs> so no worries on that. Uh, let's see. Is there any more questions from anybody before we uh, before we start wrapping up? Any more questions at all? Oh, there's oh, I see one. Oh, there's a couple of them. Uh, Carol, uh, Carol's got a question. Carol, go ahead, take it away. Okay, so you had mentioned that Sarah Edmonds had written her memoirs and they were fictionalized. Uh, to a degree. Do you know of any other women soldiers who wrote memoirs? Loretta Velazquez, who was a Confederate, she was Lieutenant Harry Buford in the Confederate Army. She also wrote memoirs. Hers came out in 1876 called The Woman in Battle. Much like Edmonds's memoirs, 
highly fictionalized mm -hmm. with with Loretta Velazquez she she's one of those those women who is much maligned there's there's the Velazquez was a fraud a hundred percent fraud camp there's the everything she said is true camp I think it's it's somewhere in the middle I was able to find a couple of records in um, in the Confederate records at the National Archives that are about Lieutenant Buford. So I believe that she served. I don't think we can trust her retelling mm -hmm. of it. And and I think in both cases with both Edmonds and Velazquez, they they were writing memoirs about doing things that women weren't supposed to do. So that was going to open them to a great deal of criticism anyway. And they had to write in the sort of the, the flowery Victorian way. And, and they were both savvy enough to understand that to, to sell books in that time and place, they had to write a really good story. They had to write an adventure story. And, and we know that most military service, there's, there's long stretches of it that aren't that interesting. And so both of these women, they had to, well, I guess they didn't have to, but if they were gonna sell books, they had to make it good. And that's why both of them have very unreliable memoirs. I see. Okay, well, that's a shame, thank you. All right, the next question we have is from Edward. Edward, you're up, go ahead. Edward, looks like you're still on mute, maybe. Anything from Edward? Oh, anything? You're, are you there, Edward? I think you were with us for a second there. Uh, it looks like Edward's coming uh, on and off of, uh, of mute here. Oh, I think you're live, Edward. Yep, can not hear anything, Edward. Hmm. Well, uh, Edward, uh, maybe uh, you might be on mute uh, or you might have a, a microphone issue. So we're gonna go ahead to another question. And Edward, just raise your hand again if uh, you get your mic working. Uh, next question. Here we go. P. Frank, that's you again. Yeah, sorry, it's me again. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I have kind of a two-part question, I guess. Um, I, I know that sometimes when, when we do research on multiple women, we tend to develop uh, favorites. So I'm wondering if, uh, if you have developed a, a favorite among these women and why. And then if not, is there some additional story or uh, an, an additional anecdote you'd like to tell that didn't, you didn't perhaps have time to put into the original presentation? Wow. Who's my favorite? <laughs> you know, when Lauren and I were researching women soldiers, it, it, it was it was a big part of it was like 10 years of work and and this is like asking who my favorite kid is um i would who's my favorite francis hook is, is one of my favorites you know i think her story is is very poignant, you know, that sense of, of not wanting to be left behind and willing to, to 
to go be a soldier just so she wouldn't be alone. I'm, you know, Wakeman, Rosetta Wakeman's story is, is I think so typical of what a lot of working class and farm women's lives were like in the 19th century. And I've always admired how she was determined to better herself and 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 sadly for victorian women one way to better yourself was to pretend to be a man you know, one thing i discovered doing the research was it wasn't just women pretending to be men to serve in the army it, there was a whole subculture in 19th century america of women pretending to be men in order to have economic and personal freedom. And there were, there were laws against passing as men. And, and it's, it's a similar, it's a similar tale. We, we understand that there were, there were African-Americans who tried to pass as white to have the privileges and the opportunities denied to them. And so there were women passing as men to have the privileges and opportunities denied them. And when I first started researching, I was just fascinated that women were soldiers more, that women were soldiers more than a century before they were allowed to have combat roles in the US Army. That didn't happen you know, that still wasn't a reality when we wrote our book, women were still barred from combat. And here are women who were in combat in the mid 19th century. That was one of the things that really drew me to the story. And then <clears throat> as I researched, I found all these women just striving to have a better life, just striving for personal independence. And, and it's very compelling, at least to me, and, and a part of women's history that I think is overlooked. Thank you. All right, uh, Edward, are you, uh, did you test your mic at all? I see you up there. It looks like you're able to talk. Can you, can you ask your question? No, no, it doesn't seem like it. Well, actually, uh, Deanne, I have a question. I actually yeah. have two questions for you, uh, if you'll uh, permit me. The first question is, if anyone wants to reach out to you, wants to get in touch with you with any questions or uh, any requests, uh, any uh, uh, leads for information, anything like that, is there a way people can get in touch with you, maybe on social media? I am on Facebook. Uh, you hit me up on Messenger. <laughs> That's wonderful. I know maybe uh, Edward, maybe if uh, if you had a question, maybe that would be a good way to uh, uh, to reach out. And my uh, actually my second question is, how can people get copies of your book? Where is it available? Uh, wherever books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, the paperback is still in print, which I'm very grateful for. And I think just, I think Barnes and Noble still carries it, Amazon. Um, yeah, it's still in print. Excellent, excellent. And oh, I think uh, Bill Kristen has the, uh, what appears to be the last question of the night in the Q&A box. Uh, Bill asks, uh, since starting your research, have you or anyone else established an online database of official records, as well as a newspaper, letter, and diary accounts of the women soldiers? First of all, I, before this was over, I was going to say hi to my friends, Bill and Glenna Joe, because I saw from the chat that they were there. Hi, Bill. Hi, Glenna Joe. It's good to see you again. Um, there's a number of websites devoted to women soldiers. Uh, some are better than others. I don't know that there, I mean, I don't have one and Probably what I would suggest is Shelby 
Harriel Hiddleston or just Shelby Harriel. She recently got married. Go to her website, Google Shelby Harriel. She recently published, um, I should have held it up. I don't have it near me. She recently published a book on women soldiers in Mississippi. And so it's women from Mississippi, women who are in Mississippi. And I, from what I've seen, Shelby Harrell is doing the best research on women soldiers right now. I, I always wanted, when Lauren and I published our book, it was always our hope that it would be the first, but not the last. And we knew there were things we hadn't found. We knew there was more to discover. And, and we always wanted someone to sort of pick up where we left off. And Shelby has done that. And I tell everybody, Shelby is, is, is the person right now. She has a blog on her website and it's so good. I read it all the time. And she, she's good. She, she is so good that she has found mistakes in my book, which is, it's, it's a little humbling at first when someone says, well, you know, you got this one thing wrong because I found this and such, but it, but it, it actually makes me so happy because there's so much more than what we did. And I'm glad that Shelby Harriel is out there doing the hard work and getting the information out.